In the majority of cases, young people who have no place to call home won't be forced to live on the streets. Instead, our welfare system is geared at reconnecting them with their families or providing them with some form of accommodation. It's not an issue of people sleeping in gutters, it's more of a hidden issue and therefore I think that adds to the whole community perception that we don't have a homeless problem. But there is a problem. Reconciliation can't always work and it goes beyond simply being a troubled teenager. It's more than, than you know, a, not wanting to stick to a curfew. There's often a whole range of complex issues which can lead, you know, from, range from violence, sexual abuse. They don't choose to be in that situation. Nobody chooses to go to a crisis refuge. The accommodation is, is one issue, but it's dealing with the, the problem of them becoming homeless is really the issue that uh, we really need to be able to attack. The breakdown of family relationships is one of the major causes of youth homelessness and it affects all socio-economic backgrounds. Well, they're often going to experience more health problems than, than your average young person. They're going to experience problems later in life because often they're not having any continuing education. Um, they don't have those familial links. And accessing financial benefits isn't as easy as perceived, nor is finding suitable accommodation. That's where short-term crisis units such as Clarendine House provide a vital role. Well, they are safe at least for that one night. They have got some people there around them that care for them and, and are willing to support them whatever they've done or whatever situation they've come from. So what can be done to help? Early intervention and a more coordinated approach between agencies are some strategies. Better understanding within the community is another. We always tend to think, well, somebody's at fault here and we look to apportion that blame on the individual. We're often the, the fault, if it's going to be placed anywhere, is with, with us all for letting the problem as a community um, get to the point where it's at. Tomorrow, in the final part on our series on youth homelessness, we look at a story of triumph, how one teenager has gone from living in crisis centres to studying medicine at university. Given the conditions today, you could understand if the NJC were using the Westpac rescue chopper to dry out the straight. The Angel was merely the prop for today's announcement. The Jockey Club is offering sporting clubs the opportunity to sell admission tickets for a coming race meeting and let them pocket the profits. It's an opportunity for every amateur sporting club in the area to do a substantial fundraising project uh, for themselves. At $10 a ticket, the sporting club will keep the cash from all sales, with a donation to the rescue chopper also encouraged. We'd like to see a portion of it redonated back to the helicopter, uh, but I, I just think it's such a, an easy opportunity for them to help themselves and raise a few dollars. 
The meeting isn't scheduled until November 17 with the NJC to hold an information night for interested clubs in July. In other racing news, the NJC has continued its push for a resolution after the Sydney Turf Club announced it will stage a million dollar race for three year olds. It would effectively kill off Newcastle's big race of the spring. It's unfortunate the way it's happened. But we are very, very definite on pursuing it. Despite a moratorium on world whaling being declared in the mid-80s, Japan has continued slaughtering the giants of the ocean through a legal loophole claiming it's for scientific research. That so-called research is a $60 million industry, with whale meat among the most popular dishes on the Japanese menu. Half a world away, dolphin and whale watching is also a lucrative industry. At Port Stephens, where it earns the local community $40 million a year, Frank Future is preparing to attend this month's whaling conference in Japan in a bid to help save the giant mammals and his livelihood. Well, I'm trying to uh, convince the Japanese that it's a good idea to preserve whales rather than eat them. He says it's clear that only one of the industries is sustainable. Watching whales, obviously, you can continue to watch them. They come every year and they go away and they come back and, and we think that's wonderful because once you've killed a whale, that's it. It's all over for that whale. The wishes of Japan will be hard to quell at the conference, but locals like Frank Future hope that these gems of the ocean will be around for generations to come. Paul Lobb, NBN News. This Layman Street office has been the central point for the region's blind and visually impaired for almost 45 years. Even though the service grew with demand, the Royal Blind Society of New South Wales has decided the building has now reached its use-by date. The building has seen its life out, it's deteriorating. We don't have good access for clients from buses or trains and the gutters out the front are deep and uh, often fill with leaves and water. Among the achievements Layman Street will be remembered for is the introduction of talking books to the region's blind in the mid-1950s. Ironically, the baby boomers who fundraised for this technology could soon meet some of the innovations of today. The need for visual assistance because of age-related eye conditions in the over-65 age group is generating an increase in demand for the society's services. The Royal Blind Society will use what it describes as best practice features for the blind and vision impaired in its new Hamilton Centre. The Society hopes its influence will rub off on the neighbouring restaurant strip to provide improved access, lighting and large print menus. Gary Blair, NBN News. While it doesn't stop it going onto walls, once graffiti is on, it's now easier to take it off. So it's an ideal surface because you can apply paint strippers to it without affecting it. It's called opal coat. Inventor Peter Hodgson says once it's painted onto a wall, it makes light work out of removing graffiti. Just a bit of paint stripper followed by a wash with water using minimal elbow grease. Being the manufacturer, I can make it suitable for wood or concrete or steel. The product has enormous potential. In the last financial year, Newcastle City Council spent just under $100,000 on removing graffiti from across the city. Peter Hodgson says Opal Coat is guaranteed to deliver where similar products have failed. It's comparable in price to top quality ordinary paints and is almost as durable as concrete once it's applied. And when it sets, it sets so tenaciously that solvents can't bite into the surface. Lyndall Derrick, NBN News.
There's only been slight changes to the Newcastle squad that beat Weston in the opening round, with Andrew Ryan to start at fullback for the injured Jamie O'Connor and Chris Hunt coming onto the bench. But all players have been called on to tackle better after letting in too many points late in their first match. We racked up 46 points. We also conceded 32, I think it was. Um, you know, that's not good enough. While just four players survived from that semi-final loss of last year against Northern Rivers, it's a memory that will spur many on tomorrow at Carl Oval. That home ground certainly seems to be an advantage on match day eve. Oh, that's it, yeah. I'm glad I'm not doing a 10-hour trip. Um, yeah, we, you know, we'll have our own preparation. Only two players remain from the victorious Rivers side of last season, but the coach is confident of a repeat performance. Obviously a lot of, lot of talent down in the Newcastle area, so we'll be up against a, a fairly big pack of forwards. Coming off a promising 36-6 win against Northern Division, Rivers know this weekend's match will be a step up again. Well, basically we've just got to defend like we did last week. Uh, Defence is the key to, to most wins, especially in semi-final football. The match kicks off at Belmont's Carl Oval tomorrow afternoon at 2 o'clock. Ironically, the match of the round of Newcastle's Tui's Cup is also at Carl only on the following day. It's a grand final replay with Lakes to take on West. The Rosellas are undefeated but sit just two points clear of the Premiers. Two years ago they were the next big things of boxing but only now have Ben and Jamie Crampton made it back into boxing spotlight. It's been very frustrating, you know, I've been you know, contemplating giving it up. 32 year old Dindo Shanoi may bear the brunt of that frustration tonight in Cessnock. The pair weighed in this morning, both at the same weight. 66.40 as well. <laughs> With 40 wins from 60 fights, the weight of experience, though, will sit firmly in Chinoy's corner. Nearly 12 years now fighting, so I have more experience. Crampton has beaten him in their only meeting, and with his hometown crowd behind him, he's out to make it two from two. I'm keener than ever. I want to do this for sure. Brother Ben will fight an earlier bout against Tasmanian champion Frank Kappa. In other sporting action this weekend, Edgeworth will be out to add to an already impressive goal tally in the NBN Soccer League. The Eagles have scored 18 from just five games already this season and play Broadmeadow on Sunday. Country representative duty has drained several signs of players in Newcastle and Hunter Rugby Union this weekend. Merriweather play Eastern Districts, Maitland take on the Waratahs, while Wanderers, Hamilton and Lake Macquarie all play at home. And Windale Gateshead have the home advantage against the Hills in tomorrow's preliminary semi-final of the Premier League Lawn Bowls competition. Windale is the only Hunter club that reached the top six and a win would qualify them for the minor semi-final next weekend. Down 4 nil after as many minutes, this was the last thing Lake supporters wanted to see. Captain Ian Burke limping from the field. This looked much better. Glenn Aglin backing up from yesterday's rep game to steam through and draw Lake's level. There was little love lost in the middle, with West dishing out hits for both the opposition and themselves. After scoring one try, Paul Delaney thought he touched out for number two, but was left wondering what he'd done wrong. It was pretty clear what Paul Scovgard was in trouble for when Matthew Smith threatened at the other end. Showing persistence does pay off, Delaney did cross for a second as West went to a 10-4 lead. But just before the break, Craig Kamali locked things up with a solo effort next to the posts. A second look and you could see why West were asking questions. 10 all, Aglin was making it a big weekend, bagging a double after the break as the home side led for the first time. Points were at a premium and Willie Hammond thought one more was better than none. As the clock wound down, Gavin Cook wound up on Adam Hall. The pair both sin-binned with Kamali landing the real knockout blow, kicking home for a seven-point win.
Gosford wasn't expected to trouble north, but after falling one goal behind, the visitors quickly drew level again through Gavin Drennan. Phoenix North took back a 1-0 buffer with a cracking strike by Greg Charlton. Again, Gosford answered, Brad Binns netting his team second after a goalmouth scramble. Alan Charlton took the pressure off with a shot from the spot, while a well-worked short corner variation ended with David Willett's powerful shot that sealed the Blues the match. On the ice, the Newcastle North Stars have won their first game since joining the National League. After going down to the Bears on Saturday, the home side came out fighting against the Canberra Knights. Brett Hillier had a game to remember. He scored a hat-trick before the North Stars chalked up a 4-0 win. In Black Diamond AFL, it seems the Premiership is becoming a two-horse race, with Terry Lavoka and Cardiff both scoring good wins. Kalani Vale, though, made sure no one forgets about them with a thumping win against Gosford. It was a blowout by half-time, with the Bombers up by 81 points. Dane Amity in top form, kicking 14 goals. In basketball, the Newcastle Hunters' impressive form continues with a solid win against the Central Coast Power. Top of the table, the Hunters overcame a sluggish start to outplay the cellar dwellers in the second half, taking the game 127 to 107. The Hunter women making it a winning double, winning 107 to 80. Up until last December, there was no record of a single armed robbery in the township of Gloucester ever being committed. Then the local golf club was held up, and on Friday night, a man armed with a sawn-off weapon stormed the Holiday Coast Credit Union. Uh, the offender has produced a sawn-off uh, rifle and threatened the uh, female staff member. He's demanded an amount of cash. Uh, the teller subsequently handed over some cash. The offender has then uh, turned his attention to a female customer in the store. He stole her car keys and drove off in a white 95 Toyota Corolla, plate details NPZ349. Locals are shocked. It's awful. I mean, we live here and it's just... I mean, you think of these things in Sydney, you don't, they don't happen here in the country. And then all of a sudden, it's on your back doorstep and it's terrible. It's terrifying. Right? Drugs uh, has got a lot to do with it, I think. The big concern that country towns are increasingly being seen as easy targets. Probably a number of reasons why there has been increasing crime in country areas. Uh, one that concerns me a little bit is the, uh, the accessibility of, of small rural towns to the larger centres uh, with our improved road systems. And the General Manager of Gloucestershire Council, Norm McLeod, says accordingly the community needs more than just three police. Representing Australia's sixth largest city and a noted rugby union nursery, the Newcastle and Hunter Rugby Union couldn't believe the World Cup draw. To miss out to, uh, to Launceston, which is a died in the world, Aussie Rules city, um, is, is very hard to take. Having lobbied hard since Australia won the sole rights to host the world's third largest sporting event, Newcastle doesn't even know where its bid failed, as selection criteria was never made available. It is clear, though, that if the city had a stadium comparable to Gosford's, it would have stood a much better chance. It would have been, a, I suppose, a, a different sort of contest, that's, that's, that's for sure. But um, at the end of the day, we think we've chosen the, the best stadium on the, in the central coast, you know, Newcastle, Hunter Valley region. 
As if to extend the olive branch, the RWC today didn't rule out using Newcastle as a base for a visiting side. It's disappointing for Newcastle, but we will be looking to centre a team in the Newcastle area for at least three, two to three weeks of the tournament. It seems the powers that be will need something to soothe the disillusioned local union. It makes you wonder why we put in the hard hours to, to do all of this work when, when these sorts of decisions are made. Gosford's North Powell Stadium will also host an Australia A match against France next month. It's considered the greatest challenge of human endurance, climbing to the top of the world. But only around 1,000 people have ever made it to Mount Everest Summit, and one of them is Australian Duncan Chessel. It's a, almost a bit of an anticlimax, in fact, um, but it, it is certainly very satisfying to, to get there, having worked so hard and had so many people around, around us. The professional mountain climber is on a national tour, reliving his amazing adventure 12 months ago. On average, for every 100 people that make the summit of Everest, around 15 people die trying. One climber who didn't survive the gruelling trek was Duncan's friend, Mark Altrich. Up on a massive swing of a high and then just right down low, like to the lowest of the low, and you've, you've just lost a mate who you've been climbing with for six years. So. You can be a, a world-class mountaineer, but you know, if the mountain doesn't know that. Mark was around 150 metres short of conquering Everest before he turned back due to ill health. He died two days later from a stroke caused by altitude sickness. And it's the prospect of more climbers, experienced or otherwise, falling victim to Everest that concerns 31-year-old Duncan. He says if the weekend's mass climb of 54 people becomes the norm, then the horrors of 1996, when eight people died, could be repeated. You start to get bad weather conditions with that many people up high and you're going to see a repeat of the 96 tragedy. Cullen Robinson, NBN News. He's one of the most financial and influential of the South Sydney supporters and Russell Crowe now wants to be sidelined at the coming game against the Knights. Russell Crowe's indicated that he wants to meet Andrew Johns and we're in the throes of trying to set that up. It'll highlight what will be a big return for the Bunnies who were well supported by league followers in the Hunter as they pushed for re-entry into the competition, something George Piggins is keen to acknowledge. He's looking forward to the opportunity of thanking the people of Newcastle for their help in South Sydney's fight. A big day too for Knights hooker Danny Badiris. Should the state rake pull through Origin 1 OK, he'll start in his 100th top grade match for Newcastle on Sunday. All five state players have been named to play Souths, with a number on standby for those who don't make it through. The actual side to play is scheduled to have just one training session together before the game. I think the players accept that it's going to be a difficult couple of weeks with that not knowing exactly who's where sometimes. We've just got to uh, bide our time a little bit and see how our men get through it. Jim Callanan, NBN News. When the four FA18 Hornets flew overhead, waiting family and friends knew three months of separation from loved ones was over. Not far behind was a US Air Force KC-10, delivering some 60 other Australians who supported the fighter jets on their air defence operation on the Indian Ocean Atoll of Diego Garcia. And when the Australian heroes finally stepped on home soil, families rushed the tarmac. Been a long time waiting and it's great been excited all day just to have him home so and get some sanity and in this touching tribute to dad but for CO wing commander Neil it was another chance to bond with a son he missed seeing born he was born uh, 10 weeks prim so 
It was about three weeks into the deployment that he was born and I managed to get home uh, about six weeks after he was born for a week. Information on three squadrons' role overseas was limited, but Australia's allies were said to be impressed. Cullen Robinson, NBN News. When you compare Newcastle's Energy Australia Stadium to Gosford's North Power, World Cup rugby was never going to come this far up the freeway. While local rugby officials say they were never shown selection criteria, it's hard to fathom how Newcastle could have reached, let alone matched, the other competing venues. A, of course you have to have the capacity, uh, the infrastructure, both for, med for media and for the teams themselves, but also for the community area around it, you know, the necessary hotels um, and other infrastructure, technology. It's thought some other factors are at work in the RWC's decision, but it seems until Newcastle has a new stadium, the city will continue to be overlooked for such events and the tourism dollars that go with them. I mean, it highlights the fact that we've got a facility that they've, they've completely overlooked because it's not up to scratch. In a positive move, the Hutter Sports Park Trust have been invited to the State Premier's office to present their $44 million proposal to upgrade facilities at the stadium. I think it's a great positive, to the fact that we've been asked to go and do it. Uh, I mean, they wouldn't, wouldn't be asking us down there if we weren't being considered. No decision is expected until closer to the state election. Jim Callanan, NBN News. Newcastle United has made no secret of its desire to secure South Melbourne's Vaughan Coveney and has made the Kiwi-born striker an offer. Just where it stands should be clearer after he meets South management tomorrow. I'd expect uh, a formal response uh, from Vaughan in the next week. Uh, certainly uh, there's been some follow-up discussions from the, from the other formal offer that the club has made and the other verbal offers. They include a Parramatta midfielder, a second goalkeeper and a Northern Spirit player believed to be Adam Griffiths, brother of United's own Joel. The star striker himself, meanwhile, is attracting interest from Norwegian clubs, prompting Newcastle officials to consider their options should he depart. That's a re realistic position that we may be in. Uh, he's contracted next year to the club, although we won't stand in his way should he receive uh, you know, an offer to, to trial and, uh, and play overseas. And of the United players off contract, Joel Grinnell is heading to Europe to trial in Switzerland. Youth League Player of the Year John Majorowski is attracting plenty of interest domestically, while Brad Swancott, Todd McManus, Chad Mansley and Talon Martin are also looking at their NSL options. Colin Baldwin, NBN News. It's one of agriculture's booming industries. With a steady demand for more Australian vineyards and more winemakers, it's little wonder viticulture courses such as this one at Curry TAFE are proving so popular. I love it. Yeah, it's really good. Just the mix for, with practical to theory, it's excellent. I'm learning a lot. The course includes everything from growing the grapes, making the wine and marketing the product. The Curry campus also draws on the knowledge and support of the local industry. We've had a number of the uh, larger vineyards donate small quantities of fruit, about half a tonne each time, and that gives our students experience on fruit from different areas and different varieties that we don't have here in the college vineyard. The students were joined today by winemakers from across the state for the annual autumn wine seminar. It was also a chance for the experts to sample the fruits of these students' first harvest and the verdict. It's got outstanding colour and it's very well balanced with a good tannin finish. Lyndall Derrick, NBN News.
Earlier this year, caterpillars feasted on the leaves off mangroves at Fern Bay, Fullerton Cove and Ash Island. Several months later, and it's still not known if trees like this one will fully recover. When a similar defoliation event occurred in 97, uh, the recovery process took about four months. This one's been a bit slower. The caterpillar's attack on the trees is thought to be cyclical. Environmentalists are hoping nature will take its course and produce new trees as there's no hope yet of catching the bug. By the time people notice these things, uh, the, the caterpillar's already done its damage and, and moved on. Meanwhile, these students from Holy Family Primary School at Merriweather Beach are learning all about the concept of carbon trading. The school will plant 5,000 trees this year to reduce the effects of carbon emissions produced by cars and buses used by staff and the students. Lyndall Derrick, NBN News. Since buying the Tomago track five years ago, David Lander has invested close to $1 million into the venue, but his patience is drying up. He has three parties interested in purchasing the 10 hectare site that looks destined for industrial land, but Lander remains hopeful Speedway can live on. This could be a Speedway for 50 years if the right buyer came along. A sale is not so much imminent as it is inevitable. Losing around $100,000 a year over the last five years, Lander will not continue to pour money down the drain. We do anticipate opening next year, probably on a reduced scale. I don't think I'll run 40 times, but we, we could run 15. Meantime, having been overlooked for Rugby World Cup matches next year, now the actual prize can't even make it to Newcastle for a promotion. The rugby bus came to town today with Bledisloe and Tri-Nation silverware but without the famed Webb Ellis trophy. It's unsure just why Bill missed the bus but only heightened the fact Newcastle won't see World Cup action next year either. As for the local competition, nine of the region's players line up for country tomorrow against Canada in Bathurst, while a further 25 are representing Newcastle in Armidale this weekend. It's left more than a few clubs vulnerable tomorrow. And in NBN Soccer League action, the big game is tomorrow with leaders Highfields hosting Edgeworth. Just one point separates the pair on the ladder. Four games are to be played on Sunday. Currently in a run of tough games, it looked like Edgeworth was in for a long night at the Wolves' den. But striker Peter Junknewitz soon had other ideas, giving Highfield's keeper Mark Wright plenty to do, while his opposite number got a helping hand from sturdy defence. The ref ruled that Highfield's Robert Alexander offered a helping hand of his own early in the second half. The defender sent for an early shower while Junknewitz was sent to the penalty spot. 1-0. The Eagles stepped up the pressure and David Franze got the first of two cards for this effort, while Junknowitz took the keeper out of the equation, nailing his second with a clinical finish. But the Eagles striker wasn't finished yet, bringing up his 17th goal in seven games and third hat-trick with an absolute screamer. Edgeworth went on to win 6-1 and now leads the ladder as one of only four teams to have played seven games. The victory also sets up this Sunday's home game against Cessnock as a top-of-the-table clash. Grey Skies shadowed the Hunters' campaign to make the CHS Hockey Finals and its chances were looking equally bleak early on with North West one up. But then the Hunters' Casey Cocking returned the favour and in fine style. Suddenly North West was on the back foot and when Ebony Barber and Talina Burley somehow found themselves inside a sea of defenders, the home side hit the lead. While Cassie Butler was inspirational for the Sky Blues, 
It was Sky Lawrence who found a way through for Hunter. The locals won 5-2, but the tournament's been so even, those trying to select a state side are getting headaches. Very tough at this stage. Um, they're, they're considering quite a few players and it'll come down to the last matches today and the playoffs tomorrow. Hunter meets the Riverina in the first of tomorrow's semis, with North and South Coast vying for the other berth in the final. Colin Baldwin, NBN News. Moving north from the freezing waters of the Antarctic to Mate, the humpbacks pass close to Port Stephens. Hundreds boarded the port's four whale watch boats for today's voyage, past Yakabar Headland, shrouded by cloud, and then into the ocean. We've had four whale so far today. I'm expecting to see more. In the next few weeks, uh, you come out and on a whale watch and see 12 or 15 whales. The giant creatures of the deep can be seen navigating their way north for the next two months before they mate in Queensland's warmer climes, then return south between September and November. We're expecting around 4,000 whales this year uh, to migrate up the east coast of Australia and that's fantastic considering there were only 200 left in 1973 when whaling finished. So uh, this is the new whaling industry, uh, we believe, is coming out and watching whales. At Port Stephens today, the International Fund for Animal Welfare showed off its life-size humpback model, giving people an idea of the size of the creatures. Tour operator Frank Future has just returned from the World Whaling Conference in Japan. We sadly didn't get our South Pacific uh, or South Atlantic whale sanctuaries, but we did get a couple more boats this year, and uh, so it seems to be creeping up. And how do the dolphins of Port Stephens feel about the whales getting all the attention? Paul Lobb, NBN News. It's one of the town's historic buildings. However, after 130 years, Musselbrook Police Station and the constabulary are set to part company. The state government setting aside $1 million in the budget for new premises and a move into the modern era. We're looking at now uh, premises that's going to house our um, policing service for now and in the future and provide uh, adequate um, accommodation for our prisoners. Officers are expected to swap their current cramped conditions for privately owned premises leased by New South Wales Police. The Musselbrook Police Station announcement ends a long wait by local officers for improved accommodation and facilities. A delay which had drawn Musselbrook Council into lobbying the state government to act. Yeah, the undertaking by the Minister to Council that we were in the top three for a station in the next financial year has actually paid off. Upper Hunter Police had little time to celebrate the news after $30,000 of equipment was stolen overnight from Scone Outdoor Products. In a well-planned raid, thieves disabled security systems to force entry to the New England highway business. 30 still and Husqvarna chainsaws and two 50cc children's motorbikes were stolen. Gary Blair, NBN News.
it's a large lake here and to cover this whole area with monitoring, uh, with further research and testing and with eradication, it certainly needs full-time people. This long weekend, thousands of people were expected to pack into the Richmond Vale Railway Museum to see the restored locos run and witness the history of rail. But instead, the gates are shut after the museum's insurer refused to renew its public liability insurance. Very upset. I mean, we've never made a claim and I can't understand why we've been dumped because we haven't made any claims and we try and do everything as safely as possible. Richmond Vale is run by volunteers who pay an annual premium of $11,000 just in case someone is injured on the site. If new insurance can't be arranged, the museum will remain shut. When we're losing money and we can't pay our insurance and other things if we haven't got the public coming on site. Like we were supposed to have run today and another one tomorrow and then our big weekend and we can't have it unfortunately. The same insurer has also dumped five other historic railways in New South Wales and 13 in South Australia. Paul Lobb, NBN News. For thousands of young Australians, hotting up a car and cruising the streets with the stereo turned up is a way of life. But according to those who spend thousands making their cars look and sound sporty, that way of life is under threat. People are out to enjoy themselves and they just can't anymore. You've got to have fun, you know, and I think as long as we're not hurting anyone, I don't see, you know, what the point is. From next month, a noisy exhaust could cost you two demerit points and a $200 fine. Spinning the wheels could set you back $95, while a loud stereo will attract a fine of $150 and two points. So if you've got filthy smoke belching out, or thumping sound stereos, or fine-tuned mufflers that belt out that horrible sound, you're going to lose your licence ultimately. There's lots of things that are louder than a car stereo system that going around, you know, whether it's a truck or a motorbike or whatever it is, there's heaps of things louder than the car stereo system. There's no noise meters going to be around and things like that, so uh, what could be loud to one policeman could be, you know, moderate to another one. Paul Lobb, NBN News. On the northwest plains of New South Wales near Moree and Narrabri, the cotton harvest is all but complete. But what in the past has been something of a byproduct of the crop, cotton seeds are now being exported to the US, mainly for dairy cattle feed. We're confident um, that you know, we've got a future here in, uh, in the cotton seed business through Newcastle Port. So much so that a $10 million joint initiative between Grain Corp and P&O has seen these dome storage sheds constructed at Kooragang Island for the seed. 
Specifically built to hold around 11,000 tonnes, the sheds are also fully sealed for fumigation. Cottonseed, for example, USDA um, require that all cottonseed uh, be uh, fumigated with methyl bromide and um, so we can meet uh, the export guidelines for the different countries. The amount of cottonseed exported from Newcastle has increased substantially in four years. 100,000 tonnes has been sold to the US this year, but it's hoped in 2003 more than a third of the Australian export market can come out of Newcastle. But the burgeoning trade, which is expected to net around $3 million this year, could be under threat from the US Farm Bill, which will offer its farmers more than $300 billion in subsidies. Well, I guess Grain Corp is, is concerned, being in the agricultural industry, that that is um, just of the effect that has um, is a little bit unknown at the moment. Cullen Robinson, NBN News. For more than 20 years, music from Elizabeth Hollowell has filled the Newcastle Conservatorium. The violin teacher received a Medal of the Order of Australia for her service to education, but credits her students for any of her success. It's really an award for them and, and also an award for music teachers too. I mean, it's not always a glamorous profession, so it was rather nice. Another recipient, Professor Alan Hewson of Merriweather, celebrated his Member of the Order of Australia Award with family this afternoon. Not just for me, but for the discipline of ONG and for medical education. They've been my particular interest going back for nearly 40 years, so it's nice. Others to be awarded, Professor Beryl Nasher, who received the Officer of the Order of Australia for work in women's issues and education, among the OAM recipients, Michael O'Hearn for service to the greyhound industry and John Knott for work with Newcastle Lions Club, while three Hunter residents picked up the Australian Fire Service Medal.
It was certainly one of the better attended meetings in Lake Macquarie Council history last night. Hundreds turning out to see if the old idea to extend Warren Road at Cahiba through bushland to link up with Cahiba Road would feature on the city's revised local environment plan after being left off the first edition. Councillor Gordon Hughes wasn't popular with many after talking about retaining the road reservation. The jeers eventually prompting Mayor John Kilpatrick to threaten to clear the gallery and close the meeting. Labor's Chris Fotef and Mercia Buck, meanwhile, were cheered for speaking against the plan. It was eventually left off the LEP and deferred until after the completion of the Charlestown bypass, when a traffic study will be conducted. They've suggested that perhaps we wait until we see what happens there and uh, see if there's going to be uh, any need to have further roadworks or um, provision made on the eastern side. The Mayor, though, is concerned that it overshadowed debate on the rest of the LEP, which will go on public exhibition for 28 working days in five weeks' time. It seems Council can expect plenty of submissions from at least some residents. It was more than just another training session for Mark Hughes this morning, with the workout his first since leaving the field last Friday, suffering inflammation to the lining of his heart. So I was pretty nervous this morning, I got up pretty early and you know, I went and seen a specialist again this morning just to get another couple of tests and came out here today and there was no problems, we trained really hard and I got through it really well. Well enough to be confident of meeting Parramatta this Friday. Danny Badiris and Sean Rudder also trained well following injury concerns, while Steve Simpson gave his troublesome knee a rest but should be fit to play. To local league and down 10-2 at half-time, it seems South Newcastle couldn't take a trick against West in last night's catch-up match at Harker Oval. The Rosella's defence was at times ruthless, and Todd Madison couldn't put a foot wrong for the home side, nailing eight goals and posting two tries in the 44-6 victory. In last night's other game, Cessnock proved too good for the Scorpions, with Macquarie going down by 16 at home. The win keeps the Goannas in touch with the top three teams after nine rounds, while Lakes and Central still have a game in hand. Colin Baldwin, NBN News.
port of Newcastle is the Hunter region's link to the world for a variety of locally produced export commodities. To Newcastle University Professor and Hunter Valley Research Foundation Chairman Eileen Doyle, it's an asset the region has to build on for our future. We have a world-class port here, we have the largest coal odour in the world and we have still great potential in terms of growth in the port and we have available land with, with port access and we should use it wisely. Professor Doyle today gave the Newcastle Business Club an insight into her ideas of a plan to market the Hunter as the economic dynamo of New South Wales. In addition to the port, the five to ten year plan should include the wine industry and education sector reaching their full potential. Professor Doyle believes government handouts won't secure the region's future. No, we, we certainly don't need handouts from government. We need government to recognise the economic potential of the projects that we're putting forward and treat us equitably. Gary Blair, MBN News. It's been no secret that Newcastle has been earmarked for a site in the national competition. Netball New South Wales actually presented a submission with the backing of major local businesses pushing the city's case to house a team. It's understood that proposal would be to relocate the Sandpipers, one of two Sydney-based clubs in the National League, to the city. Tomorrow's Netball Australia board meeting is set to discuss the issue. Meanwhile, next Friday's National League match at the Newcastle Entertainment Centre between the Sandpipers and the top-ranked Adelaide Ravens is selling out fast. To Newcastle Rugby League in one game tonight at Toronto. Tomorrow, Cessnock face a tough task trying to push back into the top four against Lakes United. In Rugby Union, Nelson Bay and the Waratahs is tomorrow's big match, while Singleton could push into the top four with a win against the Wanderers. And Broadmeadow head to Western tomorrow in the NBN Soccer League. While on Sunday, it's two versus three with Highfields hosting Hamilton. Just one point separates the two teams.